Hi, everyone. I'm Jack Leshner, uh, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to Columbia at Home for this collaboration between Columbia Alumni Association and the Columbia School of the Arts. Uh, I'm the chair of the Columbia Film Program. I also teach creative producing in the program. Uh, and so excited to welcome you to this panel discussion with filmmakers participating in this year's Sundance Film Festival. There's a long history of Columbia filmmakers premiering their work at Sundance. Nicole Holof Center's Walking and Talking, James Mangold's Heavy, Lisa Cholodenko's High Art, Ramin Barani's Man Push Cart, Shireen Dabas' Amrika, Courtney Hunt's Fr Frozen River, all the way to the exciting and diverse range of films in this year's festival. So I'm very pleased to be able to introduce our moderator, Minette Louie, Assistant Professor of Professional Practice in Film in the Faculty of the School of the Arts. She is an Emmy-nominated, multiple Spirit Award-winning producer, whose credits include Heidi Ewing's Sundance 2020 winning Spirit Award nominated, I Carry You With Me, Jennifer Fox's Emmy nominated The Tale, which premiered at Sundance in 2018, and Carlo Mirabella Davis's Trebekah 2019 winning Gotham nominated Swallow, among others. So I'll turn it over to Minette to introduce our panel. Thanks so much, Jack. Um, I'm happy to be here with you all, though I wish we were in person at the fun annual Columbia at Sundance party on Main Street. I've had the privilege of producing three Sundance features written and directed by Columbia alumni and working with over two dozen talented Colombians throughout my career. And I've always been so impressed with the strong sense of community among all of you. Um, tonight, we're celebrating five Columbia filmmakers from this community who just premiered their projects at the 2022 Sundance Film Festival. First up is Eric Feig, who is Columbia College, class of 92. Eric. Hi, Eric. Hi. Um, he's the producer of two Sundance features this year. The first is the audience award winner, Cha-Cha Real Smooth, a rom-com about a recent college grad who falls for a young mom played by Dakota Johnson. Eric's second feature is Am I OK? about two best friends whose relationship is thrown into disarray when one of them, Dakota Johnson again, confesses that she likes women. Um, Eric has too many incredible accomplishments to list tonight, but some highlights uh, in his illustrious career include founding Summit Entertainment, which became the most successful independent film studio of all time, serving as co-president of Lionsgate Motion Picture Group after they acquired Summit, and most recently founding Picture Star, which produces and finance premium discovery of voice content. Um, and Eric has produced or supervised or originated over hundred films, including the Twilight and Hunger Games series, La La Land and the Hurt Locker. He's also a board member of Columbia School of the Arts. Welcome, Eric, where are you calling in from? Los Angeles, and thank you for having me. Great. Um, next up is Daniel Fermin Pfeffer who graduated from our screenwriting and directing program in 2018. He produced a Sundance episodic pilot called Chiki, which is about a couple from Columbia, the country, not the school, who immigrates to New Jersey in 1987 in search of a better life. Um, previously, um, Daniel premiered his feature directorial debut, I'll See You Around, at the 2019 Los Angeles Latino Film Festival. And his latest feature script, Brujeria, landed on Colombia's 2020 Blue List, which represents the best unproduced screenplays and TV pilots written by School of the Arts graduates. Daniel, where are you calling in from? Hi, I'm calling in from Ithaca, New York. Cool. Oh, where you are, we are also an assistant professor at Cornell, right? Yeah, I'm screenwriting and film production, yeah. Awesome. Um, next, then our next two artists are Meng Tai Zhang and Lemon Guo, who collaborated on Diagnosia, an immersive documentary in Sundance's New Frontier section that actually portrays Meng Tai's memories of being incarcerated in a military operated camp in Beijing in 2007 after he was labeled a teenage internet addict. Meng Tai is a 2019 alumnus of our graduate sound art program. He uses sculpture, sound and simulation technology to create ambivalent allegories of power. Wow. Um, his work has been featured at IDFA in Amsterdam and New York Fashion Week among many other places. Hi, Meng Tai, where are you calling from? Hi, uh, I come, uh, call you from New York, upstate. Great, awesome. I'm, I'm in Queens, actually, calling from Queens. Um, and Lemon is a 2018 alumna, also of the Sound Art program. She creates voice-based performances and installations that connect people to current environmental and cultural realities. She's exhibited her work in numerous places, including Rubin Museum of Art and BBC Radio 3, 
Um, Lemon was a commission composer and sound designer for the United Nations Development Program and created music for the short film, All the Pros in the World, which won the Palme d'Or at Cannes last year in 2021. And Lemon, where are you calling from? Hi, uh, I'm actually calling from China on the Southeast side. Thank you for joining us so early. Last but not least, Olive Nosu is a 2021 screenwriting and directing alumna whose short film, Egun Gun, did I pronounce that correctly? Yeah, that's right. Egun Gun, which means masquerade, um, which is about a young woman returning to her birthplace, Lagos, Nigeria, in search of healing. Before Sundance, the film premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival and also won Best Short Film at the Hamptons International Film Festival. Olive's previous short, Troublemaker, won a National Board of Review Student Award and is now streaming on the Criterion channel. Um, and she was a 2020 BAFTA Piggott Scholar and one of four African Promises directors selected by the Institut Francais. She's in development on her first feature with Film 4 and was recently selected for the 2022 Sundance Screenwriting Lab. Olive's mission is to tell truthful cinematic African stories. Ooh, what an impressive group. You guys are on fire. <laughs> um, Olive, where are you calling from? I'm calling from England, from Durham, a little town. Nice, nice. Before we dive in, I just wanted to let the audience know that there will be some time at the end for questions. So feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit questions um, throughout our talk. Thanks to those who submitted questions already. We'll start with the question that was asked the most, which was, how did your Columbia experience help shape your career, both in terms of your creative choices and your professional trajectory? I'll start at the top of my screen. Um, Olive? Yeah. Um, I mean, I only just graduated, so it feels very um, influential to, to all I've done so far, especially because, you know, for me, choosing to come to Columbia really was a um, decision to commit to three years of, like, fully committing to film work and, and finding my voice and learning the craft. I've been working for a few years in advertising and before that in investment banking. So it's like quite different. Um, wow. And yeah, it was really a leap of fate to be honest too, to choose to quit my work in London and move to New York. And I, and I really think while at Columbia, um, yeah, I, I really just, drill down on what it was I wanted to say um, and understanding kind of my unique point of view and then how to create the visual language to um, tell African stories. I'm really interested in kind of African stories, but not just as narrative, but as visual storytelling style that kind of takes from our culture and our ways of art. So um, a lot of practice in that, I would say. Um, and, and yeah, just somehow have met really incredible collaborators who, you know, I applied for the BAFTA scholarship, which allowed me to continue at Columbia. And it was through that program that I met my current producer who I've worked with on this short Egungun and who I'm working with in my first feature. So kind of indirectly, it's been responsible, I think, for, um, yeah, a lot of what's happened so far. That's great. I love repeat business with the same producer. That's great. <laughs> um, Meng Tai, can you answer the same question? How did your Columbia experience shape you? Oh, that's been great. Actually, uh, I come to Columbia uh, at uh, 2017, uh, where I was studying sound arts uh, in the School of Arts. And actually where I learned VR uh, in Unity and combined a bunch of the uh, uh, sound and music composition skills. And also I met Lemon and uh, uh, Ethan Edward, who is also uh, one of the uh, program coder uh, help, help us to develop the uh, diagnosia in Unity. Great. Yeah, and Lemon, you want to take off? <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, so we diagnose is actually a very small team and we have a very con high concentration of Columbia sound art people. Um, so we basically form our team while we're at Columbia. Um, and then uh, what else? Um, a sound art is a very like, open and interdisciplinary program. And this is where it allowed me to transform from being just a music composer to more of an interdisciplinary artist. And I started you know, working in 
theater and film and VR and just felt pretty open and free and encouraged to try different things. Um, I think that that stay with me. It's very important. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, Daniel? Hello. Um, so Columbia was my second film school. It was um, to get my master's of fine arts. And for me, it was to kind of unlearn a lot of things and to, you know, to relearn um, basically the craft of filmmaking and to commit and to learn how to become like a full-time artist. There's one thing I took away from Columbia was uh, the sort of commitment and discipline that one needed to become, you know, a self-sufficient artist. Um, I also always knew I wanted to teach uh, alongside my filmmaking career. So that was something that was attractive to me to getting an MFA. You know, when I first graduated from getting a BFA at NYU, I, you know, the last thing I wanted to do was go back to, to school. Uh, I never thought I would. And then, you know, it was working in the film industry, working on big sets as, as a location, every, everything from interning to uh, location scouting for big movies and all these things uh, kind of led me back to why I was in this. And for me, it was to tell stories and to be, to be an artist and to direct and write and produce on a creative level. So for me, that was what Columbia was gonna let me do. And it was, you know, it was buying more time to do that and to, and to get guidance from the, you know, the wonderful faculty and kind of, you know, find new peers to, to collaborate with that were gonna commit themselves the way I wanted to essentially. Um, artistically, um, I think I really learned how to direct at Columbia, um, taking like Eric Mendelssohn's directing classes really changed my life essentially. And, um, also, well, yeah, that's basically what, what, and also the international part of it, you know, being, being around all these international students and all these and a lot of, and we watch a lot of international films too that I, I might have not exposed myself to had I not been in that program and kind of understanding, you know, more meditative cinema versus, you know, the American way of cinema and, and you know, and sort of kind of sometimes poly, cross pollinating the two in my own, in my own craft. So. Great. And Eric? Um, I attended Columbia as an undergraduate, so I have, I think, a sort of a slightly different point of view or just to this, to this group, which is, um, although I did take a lot of film classes, and I actually um, graduated in the ancient days of 1992, which I think is um, the last year before uh, they started offering film as a potential major, so I really just had a classic liberal arts background. Um, and I think actually that was really the best thing that prepared me for what I was doing and what I still continue to do. I think that the having a wide breadth of knowledge as an undergraduate at Columbia, which is so about the core curriculum and really kind of learning the fundamentals, uh, prepared me. Um, it's almost like uh, boxing or you know jazz. You have to know the fundamentals cold before you can improvise. And I really, uh, not to say that I knew them cold, but I felt confident in my sense of um, a sense of connected tissue between narrative and uh, sort of different. Uh, artists and writers who were working their way of, of trying to make sense of their times, you know, and to me, that was a really inspiring kind of, a, a, um, you know, undergraduate experience, and also the experience about Columbia and Columbia in New York City, it was a great uh, dynamic tension for me, where I felt like, okay, here's something where we're looking back to all these people who have written or directed or painted or told or composed and tried to make sense of their world. And in the sense of New York, you have a sense of it's a very, very dynamic, innovative world where it's constantly moving forward, you know, and, and creating new. And so that felt like it kind of propelled me to give me the confidence uh, to, I mean, drive out to Los Angeles, not knowing anyone and just say, I'm just going to figure it out. I'm just going to try and figure out how I can tell my own stories and work with people who have stories they want to tell and enable those to exist. And the sense of being able to realize that actually it is possible to come up with a notion and turn it into a plan and then turn it into a thing that happens. Uh, I really got that sense of confidence from Columbia. That's awesome. I love that. I love that. Um, now let's take a step back and, and talk again about the Sundance films that I, I mentioned. Um, Olive, can you tell us the origin story of Igungun and its journey to Sundance? 
Yeah, definitely. Um, I had been considering what I would make as my thesis film for a while. Um, and I knew it would be set in Nigeria because all my work has been. Um, and I really wanted to make something that felt more personal to me. My, my short before that troublemaker was also set in Nigeria, it follows a little boy. Um, and, you know, is very much about themes that have to do with where I come from, but the character himself um, felt a little distant. Whereas I really wanted to tell a story. Yeah, that felt really personal to me. And um, I think the real genesis of it is memories I have of, you know, growing up in Lagos and kind of a sort of survivor's guilt um, I feel or wrestle with, with, you know, my life that has, you know, for the last 15 odd years not been in Nigeria. And I think it's something that, you know, many immigrants think about and, and wrestle with, you know, when you leave home and you make a life for yourself for whatever reason somewhere else. Um, and kind of the relationships that still exist with people you've left behind and um, really thinking about, yeah, those who, those who stay and those who leave and, and how those relationships persist, persist or don't. Um, was the genesis. And so I, as I started working with my producer, Alex, and we were looking for funding for the film. And so we applied to the BFI and that was where we got the funding for Egungun from the BFI and their um, five films for freedom program, which is specifically um, a fund for LGBTQ plus stories. Um, and so we applied to that program and um, received 20,000 pounds, which is great because my last film I'd made for like $3,000. So <laughs> that felt like quite a big increase. Um, and yeah, once we got that money, it really became about, yeah, obviously shooting, which was difficult because it was COVID time, um, but we achieved it and now we're here. That's great. The BFI is the British Film Institute for those yeah. who don't know. Um, and, and that was the entire, but that, that's where all the financing came from. You didn't need to raise any more than that. No. Yeah. Got it. And how many festivals did the film play before Sundance? It played at TIFF and the London Film Festival and Hamptons. Got it. Thank you. Um, and Mung Tai and Lemon, did you, um, how did you come up with this? I mean, it's based on your life, really, Mung Tai, right? But why did you, how did you decide to, to put your life on screen like this? Oh, actually, uh, the thing, as a story come to me uh, in 2018, when I saw the news from, uh, come out from WHO, saying they are classified internet addiction, uh, no, uh, gaming disorder as a, a formal mental disorder. And I was shocked because that's actually, I heard a story different from that. So I go back, track a uh, Google search uh, where that actually comes from. And later I found that a paper uh, published on a UK journal called Addiction in 2010s. Uh, the, one of the author was the director of the camp that I was sent in uh, in 2007. And I go through his paper. And so when I read it, I saw there two major questions I want to ask. One is, no one told me I could be used as a research subject when I sent to this place. Either me or my parents being informed uh, they are actually a research center. And two, um, this center charge a large fee, but in his paper, he didn't declare a conflict of interest in this case. So, Followed uh, by those two questions, uh, I start with the uh, uh, kind of research, uh, both scientific uh, literature and new collective news uh, from published media. Uh, try to build the connection between my uh, personal experience in this place and how these issues be discussed publicly. Uh, then it become one of my, uh, actually uh, one of my work uh, for the degree show in uh, 2019, 
uh, in my graduate show uh, in Columbia. Then uh, I further developed it with lemon, uh, uh, a kind of wipe VR, wipe based VR form uh, that everyone could, could assess it uh, with such a simple uh, website. It is a recreation of that uh, isolation experience uh, of, of that internet addiction stuff. Uh, later on, uh, we applied uh, a grant uh, from uh, Wayfarm Nesca uh, that offers us a big uh, uh, opportunity to develop further uh, in uh, a VR style. And also we got the support from uh, Edifa uh, Doc Lab R&D program. Um, so we, we use these two uh, fundings to as a main source to support uh, developers uh, pro, uh, this project further. Great, so they're both grants. You got two grants for this project then? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, basically. Yeah, essentially uh, the Wave Farm grant uh, and the ITFA Doc Lab, which is more like the development lab, but they also gave a small fellowship. Uh, got it. Yeah, and, and ITFA is the International Documentary Film Festival Amsterdam. For those who don't know. Which is where the film premi world premiered, right? Yes, yes. So that's, was, that, that was our first stop. Was that in person, that festival? Yeah, it was in person, but we couldn't make it um, because of COVID and visa and stuff. So, yeah. And then Sundance was online. Um, I would just like to add that uh, we wanted to make the story, I think part of it is because we feel like the discourse of internet addiction has been very one-sided. Um, we hear from like the so-called experts, um, self or self-acclaimed self -claimed experts and or institutions and authorities and media a lot. Like in the and the people who are labeled or diagnosed as internet addicts, they they don't really get a say in this. Um, they are talk about, but they don't get to talk. Uh, themselves. Um, so we thought it's important to show show their side of the story and how Monta experienced it himself in that camp. Got it. How long were you in there, by the way? Uh, for a month. Wow. Uh, for now, yeah. usually it take like three to six months uh, based on the suggestion for, uh, by the therapist in this camp. Three to yeah. six months, wow. Yeah, and it's also crazy because they, they claim to treat internet addiction, but they took in people who basically had like anything that their parents didn't like. For mm. instance, teenage dating is from the in China, and a lot of people were sending for teenage dating. Um, there was this, this guy that Montai told me he met was 30, he was in his 30s and he had an affair online. And his wife and mom just threw him in there. Wow. And, and like there was a 10 year old kid who um, took off his pants in class to <laughs> um, imitate an anime character, a Japanese anime character. And he was also sent there. And um, there were people who were like sent there for having so-called feminine traits, young men who were sent there for having feminine traits. Um, yeah, a lot of crazy, crazy things. I have one more question before you guys. It, it, are you ever wor are you worried that the, that the Chinese government like are you since you're criticizing? It sounds like you're criticizing the, the Chinese government. So like, do you ever worry about what the blowback would be from this project? <laughs> you don't have yeah, to. Uh, if you don't want to. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm in China now. Um, right. <laughs> uh, well, I I can say that. Um, we're being cautious in our release strategy and, but uh, actually a, a pretty significant, significant part of our teams are based in China. And we kind of talk about it and decided that we're willing to take this calculated risk. And so we feel like it's, a, it's an important subject. Cause they, even nowadays, Monta was there in uh, 2017, but even nowadays uh, people are still- 2007. Oh, sorry. 2007, not 2007, but even nowadays, people are still being sent there in large numbers. So we, we really want to try to expose this. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Um, 
Daniel, so how, um, what was your origin story for Chiki and its journey to Sundance? Um, wow, it, it it's, goes years in the making, um, kind of stems with a, a close collaboration with a, with a Latinx best friend, brother of mine, Carlos Cardona. And essentially it's about his, his parents immigrating from Colombia. And uh, he had been saving money for it for years and um, kind of started developing the script in a pretty serious level with our other partner, Sofia Daban and I, and um, kind of about two years ago. And we kept uh, planning uh, to make it and things kept getting postponed. And then finally COVID hit and we got kept getting postponed. So it was a, it was a long journey. And in, in some respects, COVID allowed us to succeed in this weird way because people were sort of out of work when we were, when we were filming and it was pre-vaccine and all that stuff. So we, we actually got to get like some pretty professional crew at times to help us. And um, so the origin story really just, it comes from his parents and in that moment. And, you know, originally it was supposed to be a short film um, and I sort of swayed Carlos away from that. Um, just knowing about the, the feature film market that we were talking about, short to feature, and the way he was writing it was just a little too long. So that kind of molded us into making it a pilot. You know, it kind of pushed us into making it a pilot. It's, it's also kind of like running where, where the, where the industry is going, just kind of following that, that trend, but in a, but in a good way, because his mother and his father and his mother, especially Cheeky, her real, real name is Ruth, has such a rich history and story and comes from the struggle in Bogota, Colombia, um, and sort of has this fascinating um, hustle and flow to her and, and, you know, her journey from Bogota to Newark, New Jersey, to Montauk, to finally Southampton, and sort of how she carved out her version of the American dream. It's sort of a fascinating story. And it was, you know, part of Carlos's goal and, and the origin of that was, you know, him and I are Latinx filmmakers and, and we're always trying to, to make stories either about, um, you know, the, the Latino experience in the United States, um, which is, you know, we, we wanna make that, uh, distinguish that from the Latin American experience, but the, the Latino experience in the United States. Um, but also, you know, show another side to the immigration story, a kind of more of like a working middle class side to it. That's not, you know, that's not poverty porn, essentially, where, you know, we wanted to do something truthful. We want to do something from, from a different perspective, an honest perspective. And, you know, that was kind of the, that's kind of the legacy we're trying to, to, to move forward with, you know? Right. And how did you get your funding? I, that uh, nickel and diming that comes from just hard savings. There, it was roll of the dice. There's no no grants, no labs involved. Just just working on. <laughs> Carlos works as a cinematographer, a, a documentary cinematographer, uh, and he has his own gear. And he works with a the another cinematographer, Rand Rosenberg, who who shot the film, and an editor, my co-producer, and she, you know she works with me on all types of stuff. She co-wrote a, a short film together recently called "Don't Come Close," Sophia Devon. So you know we're a tight little New York City team, uh, pretty ragtag gorilla still, and you know together we 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 made it happen in that way. Okay. Can you tell me more about how you shifted from it being a short to a pilot? Like, does that mean it ends in a cliffhanger? Do you have the other episodes planned out? Like, and what is your ultimate goal with it in terms of selling it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when he was developing it and like the different rewrites of the script, um, Carlos can sometimes be a little stubborn. He's going to laugh when he, when he hears this, but he, you know, he, he likes to, he likes to write big. And so the story just didn't fit the short medium. Essentially. I just said, this isn't a short, there's no, there's no market. It doesn't matter if you're in a tier B or tier A festival, there's no market for a 27 minute short uh, that's not being basically lab supported from from the jump you know and so if you're not being flagged already by certain labs and certain incubators and whatnot it's going to be very hard to get like a, a essentially a bloated short into into the festival and so I kind of steered him towards the the pilot at one point and you know it stuck with him Sophia kind of backed it up because she really helped uh, co-write a lot of it, um, especially on the, the proof of concept that now screened at Sundance was was certainly um, you know uh, co-written by Sophia and, and tailored that by her. But that was that was the one of the big decisions. And then you know, with that said, we also thought 
Well, even if even if we made it into a short, and let's say we cut it down because there was versions that were 17 pages, 25 pages, 16 pages, and then it was just a we at that point it was like we were cutting out a lot of the beautiful elements and sort of the emotions that we wanted to convey. And so it was it, I said it's better we shoot, you know, the 26 page version, make it a pilot. The whole industry is going towards series anyways, whether it's mini series or ongoing series. And so let's just embrace that. Also, we we figured we're gonna make this kind of art house, super 16 millimeter, recreate the 80s, um, Colombian immigration story told from the Latinx, New York City, New Yorker perspective. Um, and so that's that hasn't been seen before. And we were using a lot of the filming um, sort of styles and techniques from like Casavetti's Almodovar, you know, when we're talking about from the performances all the way to how we were shooting it. Uh, so we weren't really shooting it like a, a typical, any sort of typical TV series, which I don't even know what that means anymore because TV is so advanced now, but but that's, you know, that's that's really where it, where it all came from. And we knew that if we went that route too, I convinced Carlos at a, at a, at a you know, a, a nascent stage, if we went that route, there's less competition making something of this, you know, of this high quality um, on such an independent level, there's less competition in the indie episodic programs in general, whether we're talking about South by Southwest, Sundance, Tribeca, or, or anything, Austin Film Festival, Series Fest, whatever it is, there's right. just less, less, less competition. You know, everyone's making a short film and everyone wants to go short to feature or a lot of people, that's how, you know, but the, but the indie pilot, you know, how, how many people are really making that sort of quality on that on that kind of indie scale and, and that artfully and so we we rolled the dice and, and that's it worked out yeah. it's a smart strategy and a, and a good tip for everyone listening um eric what tell us about the origin stories of your two features well so i launched picture start as a financing and production company so we have financing of our own like sort of under our our hood that we are able to use to deploy for both development and occasionally financing. Uh, so Am I OK was the first feature that came my way. So we didn't really intend to have two movies at Sundance, but we did by accident. Uh, Am I OK was a movie that um, a producer that I knew, Jessica Elbaum, who was partnered with Will Ferrell, a company called Gloria Sanchez, uh, she was trying to make uh, it, they had developed the script actually for many, many years on their own. It's inspired by her real life friendship with her best friend who wrote the script. Uh, so Jessica's a producer, her friend Lauren is the writer of the script and it's based on kind of their story and Lauren's story. Um, they developed it on their own. Uh, they had uh, attached and interested Dakota Johnson to play one of the roles and they had brought on Tig Notero and uh, the comedian and Tig's wife, Stephanie Elaine, to co-direct the feature. Uh, and they were trying to put financing together. They had a company, um, uh, Christine Vashon and her partner were going to finance it. Um, and they were looking for someone to finance half of the film. At the time, the budget of the film was $5 million. Um, and we decided to co-finance the movie. So we were gonna finance half of that other, you know, two and a half million um, through a series of random events. Um, the other financing had dropped out. COVID, uh, we kept the movie alive, we reconstituted it, added on new cast, it kept Dakota obviously, but added on uh, the full cast and then financed the movie. And I just, I, I financed it from my own internal financing. So that was, you know, our uh, corporate, you know, so we decided we did not do any uh, pre-sales or risk mitigation. Uh, for me, I really was thinking I'll finance this movie. I want to have worldwide worldwide rights available because I was thinking that a streamer would be the likely acquirer for the film and uh, having any pre-sales would not be worth it to kind of muddy up the chain. You know, if we were willing to take the capital risk, we'd be willing to take the capital risk. Um, we decided to bankroll it on our own. Um, I jumped in as part of the producing team and as the lead and sole financier. And so it was responsible for everything from, you know, the pre-production through final delivery. Um, during the course of working on that film, Dakota and her producing partner, um, a woman named Ro Donnelly, had another movie that they were working on uh, called um, Cha Cha Real Smooth. That was from a young writer, director, actor, editor, amazing kind of like polymath, uh, multi-hyphenate named Cooper Rife. Um, 
he had made a movie called Shit House when he was in college at the age of 23 that he wrote, directed, starred in, edited, and produced. He made it for $40,000 and it won South by Southwest. And I loved it. I thought it was great. So when they told me they were working with him, I was like, oh my God, I love him. He's great. Um, they showed me the script. I came on board that as a producing partner to them as a financier. And as that budget crept up, um, and that budget ultimately was a uh, little over 10 million gross, um, you know, because we had put a budget together and I had just financed this Am I OK, which we were in post-production. I brought on a partner, which was Endeavor Content. Uh, mm -hmm. They split the movie with Picture Start. So we co-financed that movie. We were producers on both of them, fully financed Am I OK, co-financed Cha Cha Real Smooth. And as Sundance was looming, that became our opportunity for both movies as uh, to bring them to a public, but more, not more importantly, just as important to find a distributor uh, because we were, you know, fairly risked, uh, you know, in terms of uh, our, our cash equity um, and brought the movies to market, uh, which was great, uh, found um, Apple Plus, uh, Apple TV Plus picked up Cha Cha Real Smooth. Um, HBO Max picked up Am I OK? Um, and then the great sort of cherry on top is that Chacha Real Smooth won the audience award at Sundance, which is great. Yeah, it's awesome. Congratulations. You had, a, you had a fantastic Sundance. I'm so envious of that. But I'm, I'm curious with Am I OK? You said the original budget was $5 million, but then when the other financier dropped out, which has happened to me way too many times, did you end up crunching down the budget when you, you know, went all in yourself? We did. I mean, unfortunately, like at the time, it was... When we picked it up, it was going, it was hustling, going to going to go into production. And then we kind of realized that actually, it, you know, all these things had not, money was being spent, but it wasn't actually ready to, I mean, that's the worst thing. You know, you have to like, you know, film financing is a game of measure a thousand times and cut once, you know. Um, but this, you know, unfortunately, a lot of money had been spent early on and they were not ready to hit their start date. And then the co-financier dropped out. So obviously wasn't their problem. Uh, so we tried to kind of you know, keep alive. And then um, the first, I literally, I remember the first moment where we said, you know what, we'll finance the whole rest of it. It'll probably go from 5.1 to 5.4, you know, but that's okay. We feel comfortable with that. And I said, let's everyone come to my office. Let's all have our first production meeting of what we're going to do to actually hit our start date. That was on uh tuesday uh march 11th and the reason i know that is because it was tuesday march 11th when he said you know covid may be a thing so <laughs> maybe let's kick our start date a couple of weeks but we're going to keep this movie alive and we'll see what happens and then of course march 13th you're like uh, i think covid's a thing and um we all had to reach out and sort of figure out what to do and then we kept alive actually we started on February 1 of 21. So mm -hmm. we, March 13th of 2020, we just kind of like, hey, what can we do? How to reconstitute it? What are we bringing on cast? What should we do with our budget? Where should we make this? How do we make a movie during COVID now? And, and then try to figure that out. And we, we, and we made it, we shot February 1 in Los Angeles. And I'll just say, we had a 20 day schedule with 20 days of COVID interruptions. Oh my God. <laughs> That's crazy. Did you did, did it double the length of the shoot or? It, uh, it, the outgoing budget was not the same as the ingoing budget. So I'd oh say. <sighs> well, you got it done and you sold it. So congratulations. Yeah, we sold it. <laughs> um, and with Cha Cha Real Smooth, did you also, when you co financed it with Endeavor, did you keep all the world rights open as well on that one? Yes. Yeah. I mean, so basically we have the great luxury. I mean, that's not, that's, that's, a luxury. I mean, you can't always do that. And in fact, actually, and in fact, it doesn't always make sense. In fact, there's a movie I'm doing right now, um, which, um, or that we're, we're putting together and we, because of the budget range for that and the subject matter and just a whole bunch of different things, we decided, you know what, let's actually pre-sell the international rights on this and we'll take a gap against North America. We'll ride that risk, but pre-sell international, which is, um, I wouldn't have done that a year ago. I wouldn't. I would not do that with everything, but we decided to do it with this. So the, I think the key right now to the market, for better or worse, is everything's different. Every single thing is different. You know, we made uh, six feature films last year, and literally every single one of them has a radically different business model. 
Um, and the same thing now. So right. nothing's the same. Right. Cool. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, gosh, we're running out of time. I'm, I, this is such an interesting conversation. Okay, I'm going to combine my next two questions um, and start with Olive. Do you feel that Sundance has opened doors for you? And, and what are some of your best networking practices that you want to share? Uh, yeah, I mean, definitely um, already. I think um, I started chatting with Sundance last year and the relationship has developed. And, you know, I'm now in the screenwriting lab. Um, for my feature and that has definitely brought interest to that feature and so now I'm in talks with you know different producers and financiers um, for that project um, and yeah just off the back of this short as well um, I've been in some really great meetings that hopefully will bear fruit um, so I think and also frankly just like meeting some really amazing filmmakers and forming community um, has felt really fruitful as well and um, yeah, I think it's really important to, to just have a group of, you know, people who are doing the same thing and on the same journey that you can, um, lean on and talk with and, I don't know, discuss anxiety together. Um, and, um, what was the second question? Oh, networking tips. Mm -hmm. I'm terrible at, <laughs> at that. Um, honestly, I think, um, yeah, my, my I don't have networking tips. I, I think being um, honest and kind and following up with people is really my strategy. It's very simple. Um, and yeah, following through, I think um, I'd like to think that kind of the work speaks for itself and and, you know, my practice speaks for itself. And that's been working so far. So. Great. Thank you. And Meng Tai? Yeah, uh, since I'm really new to this field, uh, I think Sanders do really help me, uh, help me and Lemon to build up the uh, connections with uh, other filmmakers, uh, industries, uh, old people from the companies. Uh, yes, yeah, so really help us to meet different people's uh, and opportunities. And any network? Um. Uh, networking tips. Um, I, I don't have a specific one because I, I'm I'm doing so bad job uh, for the networking. <laughs> um, yeah, we're not very good at networking either. Montai Montai is like this like uh, uh, crazy polymath as well. He like directed, wrote, um, and like did animation and modeling, developing everything basically himself for the for the VR production part. Um, and I think I think like and both of us because our team is so small, it's like the production team is actually four, four people. Um, um, so we, we kind of spent the entirety of last year working on this and um, still haven't quite fully recovered from it. <laughs> Um, and it was actually really hard to go into a networking mode from from production mode uh, going into Sundance. But um, the, the New Frontier team, which is like the part that shows VR, AR, and uh, new immersive works, they they try to make it a very friendly and nurturing environment for us. Like um, for this year, because it was all virtual, um, they built this thing called the Space Trip, which is like the online Mm -hmm. social platform is where people hang out but it's also where our works are shown you can they have a virtual gallery where you can go inside and see the works being displayed and enter the vr experiences and you can also talk to people who are standing inside in front of your pieces and uh, ask them about their experience um so that's been great and um yeah and we we met interesting Filmmaker, I think like the New Frontier is, community is very sweet in that we, um, because we're all working with new technologies and new, new ways of telling stories, we're very open to sharing tips and like sharing software tips, production tips, um, and um, sharing tools in that way. And um, it, it, um, it's unfortunate that. Um, 
the virtual format limits how many people can access VR pieces because you really need to have the headset to be able to experience most of it. But um, the good side is it, it kind of draws in a specific community of people who are really into this. So you, you end up having a lot of high quality conversations that are very in depth. Um, yeah. Great. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Um, and Daniel? Yeah. Networking. Um, yeah, okay. in Sundance. Uh, so yeah, Sundance certainly opens doors. Uh, and you know, we're 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 also in discussion with producers who are attached to some big, you know, sort of uh, streaming platform companies and, and and things like that. And so that's been really cool to be both approached and to be able to approach. Uh, for me, you know, having worked in the film industry, having gone to Tisch and Columbia and just collecting contacts over the years, one thing that's been kind of nice is being able to circle back to, to industry players that, you know, I haven't been in touch with for sometimes about almost a decade. Um, but I, I emailed them and when I was working for them, you know, I, I left an impression whether it was good or bad, but they remembered me. And uh, and they're responding to me now with with this with the Sundance Laurel and with the, and the with the project and some of the press we've gotten and all that stuff. So that's been really gratifying and, and really cool. And it feels like the next stage in, in in my team's career, not just my own, but but everyone that I'm working with directly right now. Um, as far as networking goes, you know, when I was when I was younger, I used to I used to hate it because I always felt that. Um, uh, I always approached it from a very transactional standpoint because I was so hungry for success, whatever that meant. And, uh, you know, it took a long time to learn that, you know, just being just being attentive and interested and, and thoughtful and receptive to what someone's telling you. And you don't know where it's going to go, but you exchange cards or, you know, contacts of whatever kind, whether it's social media or phone numbers, whatever, emails, and then following up, uh, just like Olive said. And, and being kind, those things go a long way. So it took a while to, to get there, but, but once I stopped thinking about it as transactional or what can you do for me, um, and I kind of changed my way of thinking, especially after grad school, especially, um, it, 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 it opened doors it, in, in open conversations down the line, you know, because the film industry can be can be so uh, exclusive and and vicious and feel like a rat race and people are posting about every little accolade they have you know so it gets overwhelming sometimes and you can feel like oh, I'm doing something wrong but really if you uh, look at everything as just a small stepping stone it can go a long way and to you know and to and to reach out to people for advice works really really well when you ask for consultation as opposed to just trying to sell someone on something, for example, or, or you know, see how they can do something for you. That kind of can sometimes turn people off. So you know, it took a lot of trial and error and learning. But my tip is yet, you know, to ask people what they're doing before you tell them what you're doing. For ex for example, those are all great tips. I completely agree. Um, and Eric, do you have any networking tips? And Ashley, can you tell us about your very first Sundance and whether that opened doors for you? I was thinking about that a lot right now as I'm looking at all of my my fellow uh, you know peers and um, by the way you guys are so impressive and just everything you've done is incredible and you know hats off to you and I also am like oh my god wow I'm the only I'm so old you know <laughs> as I'm looking at like when you graduated versus when I graduated you know um, but um, the other thing that I was thinking about is that my first Sundance I went to my first Sundance when I was um 26 um and i'm 51 and so i went to my first sundance at 26 i'm 51 years old now and i've missed two sundances in my since that period wow uh, uh and, but i and i've been to every sundance in, in, in other than that you know and so they've been and so my experience of it has really changed because you know i was 20 26, I was like, oh my God, I gotta go. And then later on, it, you know, not that I'm like in, you know, eminent degrees, but it, it's my sort of what I was getting out of it changed. I will say I love Sundance and uh, it, it was a huge bummer to me that it was virtual this year because I was so excited to be there. Um, and these were my first two movies that I was financing in this new capacity. 
So I was really, I couldn't, and I knew they were crowd pleasers. So I was dying to see them with the crowd. Um, and oh well to all of us, we'll get that again, you know, at some other time. But, um, you know, my, Sundance has been incredibly influential to me. Um, when I was first starting out, it was a great uh, networking experience, although I wouldn't have even thought of it as networking. I just thought I was trying to hoover up as much as I possibly could. And that was from seeing movies to hang out at parties, to going to this or doing it that. And those people who I was with ended up becoming my close colleagues and peers. I didn't really think about that, but that just is what happened, you know, because we all were obsessed with film and we were all around the same-ish age. Um, and so kind of cementing my peer network, that's what those like early years were about, right? And then as I became a financier and a producer myself, it was um, getting to know talent who I could work with um, on their other, I only bought one movie at Sundance as a acquisitions, uh, you know, as an acquirer. And that was the movie Once. Um, and that was really, honestly, it's just a movie that I really absolutely loved and adored. And I helped get it into Sundance. And I met the filmmaker and I figured out, oh, actually I could figure out a financial transaction that would work for me, work for them and help it find distribution, which is what we did. And then the other, my other great experiences for me personally at Sundance, transformative to my professional career, were um, uh, seeing Captain Hardwick's uh, movies, uh, 13. I really love them. I met her. Um, I developed a relationship with her just because I thought she was incredibly talented. And uh, when I came across a, a book of a, uh, a girl who falls in love with a vampire and I wanted to feel really real, I went to Catherine and I said, I want you to direct this strange book like you did 13. And that was Twilight. You know, and then when I saw Whiplash and I thought that was amazing and I tried to buy it, but we couldn't uh, do it. I said, I have to meet that filmmaker. What an amazing talent. And I did. And I said, what do you want to do next? And he said, I, I want to do uh, an original musical. And I said, I've always wanted to do an original musical. And that was La La Land. You know, so it was both things happened to me at Sundance. So incredibly important yeah. milestones to me per personally and professionally. But um, I will say that it's interesting because networking is kind of a dirty word a little bit because it feels like transactional, it feels gross, you know, um, it feels like, you know, it's the corporate equivalent of social climbing. Um, but really, what I think it is, is that if you think about, you know, me coming to Sundance, if I'm a financier, if I'm a producer, I'm desperate, I'm dying to see something original, something fresh, and hear a new voice. And so are all the other me's out there. And if you're a brand new aspiring filmmaker, you're dying for someone to spot your voice and hear what you have to say and recognize what's special about your unique take on the world. So you actually have incredibly aligned interests. And to me, um, they're creatively motivated. They also have a financial aspect to them in terms of you know, the transactional element about it, but that's okay. You know, I, I do think that the key, key thing is in, in, you know, is in thinking when you're meeting someone, thinking what is their, what is their goal? You know, what, what, what are they there for? You know, so if it's a acquisition executive, if it's a producer, if it's a financier, if it's a director, if it's a writer or whoever, what are they trying to get out of this? And then try and think, oh, how does that, how does this fit into what I'm also hoping to achieve out of this, but always think about them first because uh, most people are self-interested, you know, and self-interested, e even benignly, you know, they are, you know, but I always think you have to think about that first. And then that sets off kind of the engagement in the right way because you understand what it, I mean, even uh, not to be mercenary about it, even it's just, I have a story I want to tell, I want someone to hear it. That's a goal that the other person has. So just know what it is. And then I think the key, key, key thing is follow up because everyone has a billion and one interactions in a zone mm -hmm. like Sundance, but it's what happens a week after, three weeks after, four weeks after that really, really counts. And that's the difference. Most people do not follow up and follow up is I think absolutely everything, you know? So that's my, those are my rules of the trade. 
Great, great advice, great advice. Um, we only have four minutes left, so I wanna combine an audience question with my last question. The audience question is from Gary Bocall. He says, the way people are watching TV and movies is changing fairly rapidly. Does this influence what types of projects you work on and how you approach them? And my question was, what's next for you? What, what's your next project? So if you could answer both of those questions, that would be great. And then we'll start with Olive again. Um, yes, I'm working on my first feature right now, um, and I guess if I were smarter, I would watch it, work on a TV show, but here we are. Um, I, I love film. I love film, and I can't help it, and um, I want to make films. I'm working on a TV um, idea, but yeah, my, my primary love is film at the moment, and that's what I'm doing. I love film, too. <laughs> Meng Tai? Uh, me and Lemon are planning to make a, uh, our next VR project. Uh, we are still at the research period. Uh, we just got a small grants uh, with, uh, to uh, help us to develop a, a basic structure of the script. And yeah, hopefully uh, we can start to working on the actual production uh, at the end of the year or uh, the middle of the next year. Yeah. Great. Good yeah, luck. and uh, yeah, it's about uh, the urban village in Shenzhen, which was like a special phenomenon that came with the rapid uh, urbanization and uh, gentrif gentrification. You kind of have this little village uh, circle like inside this giant skyscrapers. Um, that's, cool. that's where the, it's gonna happen. Yeah. Um, and Daniel, what are you working on next? Well, I'm, you know, I, I also um, love feature films. That's, that, that's where I come from and the short film, obviously. Um, I'm working on uh, the feature film you mentioned, Ruhiria. Um, <laughs> and I'm really excited about that because that's sort of a, a Mexican immigration story. Also, like not told like anything ever before, kind of with a, sort of like a, Nancy Drew meets girl with the dragon tattoo kind of vibe in upstate New York in 1991. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. And, uh, and then, you know, I'm co-writer on the series with Carlos and Sofia. So we're just, our life kind of got taken over um, since late November with just packaging the series and getting it ready for the, um, you know, the producers that are, you know, kind of quickly approaching us. So we're, we're seeing uh, where that can go. And, and we're super excited about that because we're approaching it like a feature film. We're approaching Uh-oh, it's frozen. Okay, well, <laughs> well, we'll go to Eric then. Eric, what's next for you? And picture start. Um, well, we're in post-production on four features right now. So just trying to finish that up. And we're in prep on two new features. Um, and, and then looking at financing a new crop of movies. Although, you know, looking at kind of what the landscape is for feature film, finished feature films, I would say that, you know, we're- Approaching it with the, with the aesthetic. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I guess we're not frozen for him, but um, Daniel, you were, you were frozen. So we, we moved on. <laughs> so. Yeah, I saw that. Sorry, I don't know where I left off. So I don't, I don't want us to go over, but yeah. But Eric, do you want, thank you, thank you for that, Daniel. So Eric, do you want to finish? Um, you're in prep on how many features, you said? Well, we're in prep on, we're in post on four, we're in prep on two, and then we're considering financing a next uh, slate of uh, films, you know, that we would do independently. Um, and then we're, we're in, in doing series right now. So we have, we're in production right now on a scripted uh, TV show right now for Paramount Plus um, that we're shooting. And then we're doing a docu we're doing a docu series, and then trying to get some other scripted shows going too. Great. Well, thank you all so much, Eric, Daniel, Mung Tai, Lemon, and Olive. Um, and thank you all of you guys for tuning in to learn more about these talented Colombians' journeys. So please seek out their work. And good night, everyone. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Bye. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank you.